Hello and a very warm welcome to the latest edition of Business Unknown, made just for you by Brightrock. As each week I talk to a business leader, an entrepreneur, somebody who's had an extraordinary life and can not only to tell us the ups and downs of that life, but also hopefully uh, take us through where we currently find ourselves in some stormy economic times and give us a few pointers, a little bit of guidance as to what the next 12 to 18 months could have in store and how we can best get through it. Today I speak to somebody because he is one of the most upbeat and cheerful people I know. He's a former semi-professional cricketer. He's got a great sporting background to him, uh, but he's now the man at the helm of Distel, which is home to so many proudly South African brands that we see all over the world. He's also a good friend of mine, so I'm particularly happy to say an extremely warm welcome to Richard Rushton. Hi, Dan. Thank you very much, and thank you for that lovely introduction. And I see that smile is there straight away again. It, it must, even the Richard Rushton smile must have dropped a few times over the last couple of months. Yeah, Dan, I think that's probably right. You know, um, obviously in the role that I, I'm in, uh, keeping a positive uh, frame of mind, both personally and for those around you, is critically important. Um, but yeah, there have been moments where I myself have kind of dragged myself out of my bed into my home office and wondered how we might make it through the day. But, uh, yeah, I think lots of lessons learned out of this uh, last uh, three months in South Africa. Um, and I think probably we've learned as a society and also as an industry that uh, much more proactive engagement and discussion amongst all the role players is critical so that we can actually understand one another's concerns, issues, particularly when you face un paralleled kind of health challenges like this COVID pandemic, you actually need to, to talk to one another. Well, I'd like to look at the Richard Rushton story because it is a fascinating one. You're in South Africa. You're a very proud South African. This is home now. But for a long time, it wasn't. Uh, talk us through some of your adventures around the world, the places you found yourself and what it's been like both doing business and living in some of these places. Just to say at the outset, I've been one of those extremely fortunate South Africans that was able to pursue a career both here in South Africa, but also abroad. And um, I started out my career at, at uh, firstly at the old, uh, the first national bank of today, but was Barclays Bank at the time. I was an executive trainee post uh, my uh, grad uh, degree at Fitz University and then got an opportunity to join at Cock Ingram which had a really fledgling but growing consumer division. And that position ultimately culminated in me running a small exports part of the business and started traveling. Um, so my first travels were to Zimbabwe and to Kenya in Africa. And then um, that business went through some change. And out of the blue, I got a call from SAB. We were looking for uh, younger uh, uh, managers to join their business because they were on the ex international expansion trail. And uh, I spent uh, just over two years in the head office functions in uh, based in Gauteng. And then I got uh, my first uh, opportunity to work abroad in Botswana. I was uh, the, the MD of the Botswana business for two years. And then from there, a five-year stint in India. And then uh, closer to seven years in uh, in Latin America, uh, from Ecuador through to Central America, we were based in Panama and then ultimately in Colombia before I came home. So I've had the unique experience of being able to live on three continents and bring up kids in a multicultural environment, which, um, you know, I'm, I'm very blessed to have had. And so is our family, in fact, to have had that opportunity to see very different facets of the world. And also, you know, play a role in this industry, which I love. It's given you a rich, rich life experience and your family as well. Uh, there will have been ups and downs for, for both, uh, for everywhere that you've been. Let's start with India. Uh, it's a fascinating country from the outside. I've never been to India. It's one of the few I haven't visited. Uh, I know a lot of people who fall in love completely with India as a country. What, what was the best part about living in India and what did you find most challenging? So the best is the multicultural diversity and the rich tapestry of colours, uh, cuisine, interests, religion, and of course cricket. And um, 
you know, it's a massive country. So just getting to travel it is is a privilege, but also challenging. And yeah, I think that for us was a, as a family was a unique experience. And of course, lots of uh, formative learning in that phase of my career because uh, alcohol in India is still uh, constitutionally, strictly speaking, prohibited due to uh, religion, yet is now freely available, but heavily legislated. So, um, you know, going through the early years of starting to build, for example, a beer business in, in India, I can tell you was, was challenging. And starting up a business literally from scratch uh, with really no knowledge of the industry there or, you know, how things work there. Navigating those changes, the tax laws, the licensing restrictions, how you can sell, what you can promote was in itself just uh, a learning experience and, and loads of fun. But I wouldn't say business normal was my routine. <laughs> Far from it. You also mentioned the cuisine. You would have had a fascinating array of, of food to taste. I often have Chinese food outside of a Chinese or a Hong Kong environment, and it's very different to Chinese food in China or in Hong Kong. Uh, what was the Indian food like? Uh, is it very different to what we can find at an Indian restaurant here? And, and what do you particularly enjoy eating? Well, that's a great question. So, uh, South African Indian food is a little different. Uh, it's more reminiscent of some parts of the southern part of India. Um, a little more spicy, hot South African uh, Indian cuisine, whereas uh, in India you find the full array of sort of spice, curry, flavor. And then obviously meat, vegetarian, and then fish play different roles in different parts of India. And so for me, just going through that rich experience and discovering that actually vegetarian food can be delightfully tasty and also interesting was part of that experience. Just discovering that rich array of and variety and then the flavors and the sensations on your palate uh, was in itself um, an experience. I must tell you about alcohol in those in, that, in those early phases is India was effectively a whiskey drinking nation. So beer and wine was, you know, very underrepresented. There was very little to speak of in terms of a wine, a table wine drinking tradition. So, and there was very little beer, uh, in fact, to, to celebrate. And that's surprising given the climatic conditions, the heat, the monsoon weather, etc. So that's the sort of, it's a, it's a land of, of great opportunity. It's a country of fantastic opportunity, certainly for beverages. And the country, as you say, of fabulous food. And all that talk of food has got me particularly hungry, which I think is a good point uh, to start tucking into some of the food that we're virtually sharing from across the country. You're uh, at home in Somerset West. I'm at home here in Johannesburg. And we've got a whole array of food. What I'm going to have a crack at first, particularly as you mentioned sausages, uh, we've got some lovely charcuterie uh, and, uh, and some maize chips, uh, which look a lot better than when I saw them on the menu. Um, these just look fantastic. So uh, I'm going to try some of that. Uh, and these are all from Stellenbosch, from uh, from where you have your offices at uh, at Distel, um, made by uh, by Bertus Passon, who's a, a friend to us both. Uh, so I'm going to have my first mouthful. Uh, cheers, Richard, and lovely to see you. Nice to see you, Dan. Cheers, and thank you for the invite. Mm. These maize chips are sensational. Yeah. Soft and polenta-ish inside, slightly firmer crust. Mm. And also not heavy, light yet uh, mm. full of flavour. Mm. Yeah? And I, I suppose for you, that's one of the the real benefits of living where you do in the winelands, uh, as evidenced by the food we're eating now. You're surrounded not just by uh, the wine that is such a big part of your business and gives the area its name, but also some of the finest chefs, finest restaurants in South Africa. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, and I think at this time, on a serious note, all of us need to do absolutely everything Thing we can to support our, our restaurant industry and our cuisine industry and our tourism industry. The journeys ended and you came back to South Africa. Just before we get back to South Africa and, and, uh, and talk about your story as you are now, from a business perspective, 
countries have very different business cultures and you often don't get to understand that until you've been there a while and realize that maybe you've been doing something in a, an improper way because it comes naturally because it works somewhere else and doesn't there but what were the key lessons that you learned from doing business across south america and and, and what's unique to that business space yeah so i think um for me latin america was uh, dealing with growth um so it, the, the the economies were actually in strong growth at the time and um as a result we had to fund and finance and support growth strongly and you know typically south africans are quite cautious um in their approach just given perhaps what we've had to work through over decades as a country and i think um we tend to be quite defensive and this is a strong of offensive growth game um in latin america so learning to to kind of back yourself uh, and the business and big strategic investments was a kind of newfound skill and then i guess the the satisfaction of that was just seeing quite a few of them you know play out really successfully um so for me that was that was a unique experience i think you know india was about coming to live with controlling what you can control and you know letting go of things that you are out of your control and that was linked to the regulatory environment to a large extent and in many ways it kind of leads in a funny way you always end up in situations for good reason and it's you know as i reflect on the last 4 months and 5 months in south africa many of those skills that you almost acquire through exposure and experience in atli in your travels many of those skills have suddenly had to you know come to the fore again uh, given what we've had to deal with in in this uh, pandemic All right, well let's uh, let's say goodbye to South America. Let's welcome you back to South Africa. And it's still something a a little cool. We've got a garlic loaf uh which has been sent up with a candle made out of butter. And mine is slightly melted already, but I'm going to Mine's also melted. Ah. <laughs> oh. So this is this is a chef having a lot of fun and that fun. butter just I got see on. Oh. <laughs> Uh, we still get chefs i think who who overcomplicate stuff and that style of food uh, i'm not sure is uh, is really where the world is heading um but when they come up with something like this it's both uh, uh, it works and it's a lot of fun as well uh, then i can see a chef is clearly clearly enjoying themselves as uh, as you have been for most of the time that you've been back in south africa uh, the last 5 months have uh, put everything and everybody into a, a new perspective uh, this stretch now from a very simple business level you couldn't sell alcohol the business takes a massive hit uh, yeah everybody will know that uh, automatically let's go just a little deeper though what wouldn't we know about a business like distel in terms of the challenges that you've had over the last 5 months aside from just not being able to sell the product that you normally would so i think the biggest challenge that people wouldn't perhaps know at face value is just the extent to which you and we prepared to look after the well-being of our of our employees because i think there was a A, a real realization that they are employees and you know the way i always try and think about it is is the person most dependent on their job at our company so we spent a disproportionate amount of time on just employee well-being both mental and otherwise and uh, you know what you wouldn't know is in this lockdown period we spent about 36000 hours on e-learning for all of our employees we took things that people may have learnt either on the job or learnt through certification programs and typical you know classroom training and we stuck that all online and and i mean it was a massive team effort and our team did a wonderful job of putting much of our work you know into e-learning platforms and that that's the good that's come out of it i think what the the sort of the tough part out of it has been you know like everybody dealing with a pandemic so pretty early on we had to put in place rigorous um safety and and hygiene and other protocols in our site so 
typically you don't you know you don't worry about physical distancing in a manufacturing site where you're running production facilities seller operations packaging lines now you've got to think well gee we had 15 people on the line some of them working in close proximity together how are we going to run that and so you know we had to run those quite differently and then we had to think uh, carefully about infection and of course we've had and on day one of restarting we had our first case so first you got to protect their confidentiality because you didn't want fear and reprisals because this is you know no one's fault and then secondly, you've got to take all those people out, you know, out of the business. So we had to isolate everybody that walked through, send them home for 14 days. So, you know, those are things that you probably, uh, that no one would have seen um, and that many businesses, so we're not alone, um, would have had to deal with. And I think now, I think it's the realisation that working, the working world and and working life won't return to what we knew it before and that we now all have to adjust. And that requires, that that means us spending more time on, on sort of mental strength and helping people through the stress of either having to work from home, you know, or partial work from home or more job rotation where you're doing more than one job because we have to multi-skill people in the event that, for example, a, a call service center, two people get infected, we have to take that call center team out and isolate them. So we need the replacement team. So we've had to ask other people to be skilled in that work. So, and I think, you know, we're not alone. So I don't want to pretend that this is, you know, uniquely our problem. But it's some of the real things that we're having to deal with. But And I, I must say, Dan, I'm, I'm pretty proud, you know, of, Again, just South Africans, you know, we we get a lot of stuff wrong, but we also, and we, we can be much better disciplined as a country and as a nation on so many fronts. But, heck, we've got a resilience and a can-do attitude, um, you know, that we knuckle down when the chips are down. And, you know, I've seen that in so many inspiring ways. So that's, and I think it's in us in South Africans. It's, it's who we are. It definitely is part of the DNA, and that's been part of the conversation with, with most of the guests we've had on this particular show. Also, our guests have spoken about the challenges and how business is changing and having to change, and uh, you've done just that. An element of your business, though, which is different to most others, is that your product is under scrutiny like never before. It has, uh, in some ways, I think, been an easy target. It's been low-hanging fruit for legislation, and it was a, a great way to distract from some of the other problems. But that doesn't take away from the fact that South Africans do have a problematic relationship with alcohol. We have, make some of the best wine in the world. I think the best wine in the world. We've got brands that the world knows. You can't go through duty-free anywhere on the planet without seeing Amarula. These are great South African success stories, and there's a lot to be celebrated in that space. But there are a lot of questions being asked at the moment what's your view on on the south african relationship with alcohol and and how we go forward and turn what can be a negative space into a far more positive one yeah great question dan so just a bit of context globally on alcohol and alcohol consumption so when figures are quoted about alcohol consumption in south africans typically it's quoted around those that claim to consume alcohol and it excludes those that claim to abstain from the consumption of alcohol. So we always need to be careful of using statistics to position, you know, the extent to which South African are a nation, South Africans are a nation of drinkers. We have an issue with binge drinking. And typically, for me, binge drinking is Friday, Saturday nights, and sometimes into long week into long weekends, where, you know, South Africans tend to drink over long periods of time continuously, and that is a real issue. And we have a problem with exposing, um, again, through poor regulation or regulatory enforcement, self-regulatory enforcement, also but government enforcement. We have a poor history of dealing with underage 
uh, drinking and enforcing sh people showing their identification to, for proof of age. So these are things we have to actually self-regulate, but also need government help to make sure that ID documents are presented and that we don't allow people who have yet to form, you know, stronger views and, you know, an informed view on these type of decisions they need to, to make in their lives. We need to do better with that. And then drunk driving is a massive problem in this country. It's linked, again, to these Friday, Saturday nights, extended uh, consumption uh, patterns. And, and there, um, you know, there are, there are, there, there are a handful of, of what we call alcohol evidence centres. Essentially, it's, it's a centre in areas where we know these problems exist in our country, comprising police, law, so legal people, as well as counselling and, and other trauma expertise where, you know, we just need to do so much better job of being vigilant at those kind of risky times of the, of the year and during the week and weekends. We need to arm those areas much better with vigilance around drunk driving and then these centres have to process effectively and quickly you know, the, the offenders, so that there's real consequence. As an industry, our programs need to be scaled up to address them. We've done work there, but I think we all recognise, just given what you described, the fact that a global health pandemic has put this industry into the crosshairs of, you know, scrutiny. We must just do it. We have to scale up those programs. And I, I want to show you that, you know, those three particular areas I've described are being tackled and scaled up as an industry. And then we need to be much more disciplined about enforcing the regulations we have. And there has to be consequence. People have to understand that you take an informed, responsible decision when you choose to drink a beautiful glass of wine or you have a tipple of whiskey. Um, you know, you can't get, there are things you simply cannot expose others to when you do that or risk others to. No, I'm glad to hear that the, that is the position and that the, it is something that you're looking at so closely, which you have to because it's, uh, as we say, an industry that is being watched watched very closely indeed. And, and now that you're in South Africa, you've got this role that, that offers many challenges. I was uh, reading an article in one of the business papers uh, a few days ago, uh, which was looking at the money that Distel would have lost in sales. Now, you must have had some fun board meetings <laughs> for the last little while, but it's it's not a situation you could do anything about. You've now got to recover from it. There'll be a lot of people watching who've got their own businesses that are hanging on for dear life. They're desperately trying to get through the next few months, the next year, however long it takes for us to get some sort of balance back into the way we operate. Taking your example of where you stand now and how you're going forward, Give us an idea of how you approach such a monumental challenge of clawing back what you've lost and what other people in other businesses can maybe learn from that approach. Yeah, so I think the first thing we did was just stay true to who we are, and that was, you know, let's look after our people because if and our customers, because if we do, and, and our suppliers, and particularly our smaller ones, who are the most vulnerable, and we felt that if, if, we, show, if we were true to that, um, that you, you know, we'd we ultimately we'd get out of this. Uh, we'd we'd be able to, you know, take all the risk mitigation steps we needed to do to protect our balance sheet, which was our biggest risk. Is you know, could we actually afford to still pay salaries? You know, you know, pay our suppliers, our small wine farmers, and then also you know, wait for our customers and help them, particularly the smaller ones, to pay us. So that for us was just being really mindful of that there were a lot of other people out there with much more difficult challenges to face and that they needed to see us as a stable friend who's going to work with them through a very difficult, challenging time. So that was the first. And I think, I think if you were to ask around, I think many would say to you that, you know, we've probably done a reasonable job of doing that, you know, of just um, firstly shoring up the financial kind of health or sustainability of the business, protecting that, but actually most importantly, protecting those around us. So that would be my first uh, observation. The second would be while, as the pandemic unfolded, and of course we were facing all of the challenges of how to deal with this unknown 
COVID-19 event. Um, we obviously formed a team and they, they're still managing it full time uh, as a distinct team of multi-functional team members. They're managing that. The other part of our business was thinking about the future. And, you know, and we were thinking in two streams, an offensive game and a defensive game. And so we really do have, you know, thoughts around an offensive game plan. And there's quite a lot of innovation that's already started to come to market as we'd obviously will, had done some of that work anyway prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. But we accelerated a lot of that to play an offensive game. And then we've done a heck of a lot of work around, you know, a defensive part of our game because we don't know quite how demand the consumer environment will actually play out. So there isn't a defensive part of our game. And then that linked to just coping skills, resilience, optimism, knowing that tomorrow is not going to be the same as it was yesterday and next week is going to teach us something new that last week didn't. And so there's quite a lot of those sort of coping sort of resilience skills of saying, hey, it's going to be choppy, difficult, volatile. You know, let's, let's accept that, embrace that. Um, look forward and just constantly jig or adapt our offensive game and our defensive game as the circumstances change. And, and that's how we're tackling our challenge. We also clearly, we've we got to make some tougher decisions. We had to, we've had to, to accelerate the process of selling some parts of our business, which we wouldn't perhaps have done under normal conditions, because we've got to actually just be true to what our core strengths are as a business. And uh, those involve some tough decisions. And again, you know, those tough decisions where you, you can't, you can't skirt. We, and I would just advise that to, to, you know, to others as well. Some, some decisions and choices now have to be made. And that's probably a good thing given, given what we've learned about this pandemic. All right. Uh, I think some some measured and some cautious optimism there. Some some great advice. And uh, what I love, Rich, and it, it's very it speaks very much to who you are as a person, is looking out uh, for the little guys and making sure that your community, your business, family is uh, is staying as strong and healthy as possible, which is never easy. But those are wise words to take. And uh, uh, we 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 can celebrate what you've done. I think with a, a little dessert because wrapping up our meal, mine's just come out of the oven, is. Uh, some apple pie and the hot apple pie will be accompanied by some nice cold vanilla mascarpone um, and I'm a big mascarpone fan uh, what I love about this dessert is both that contrast between the, uh, the the warmth of the apple pie and that nice cold straight out the fridge vanilla mascarpone, but also mascarpone itself, which I cook with quite often, uh, isn't as sweet. The vanilla adds that savory element and uh, against the sweetness of the apple pie, it's not too overwhelming. And much like I made the chips earlier, nice and light. That's a mm, really good way to finish off. Before I let you go, uh, I would ask you for one final piece of reflection through the course of Business Unknown, chatting to some incredible people with amazing stories, we've learned a lot and it's been a very educational process for me personally and I hope for everybody watching it as well. And the learnings have come from two chief spaces, when people have done well and when people haven't done so well. And we all have those bumps in the road. If I can ask you to look back and uh, answer them in the order which, uh, which comes more naturally to you, your proudest moment, your greatest triumph in the business space where you thought, you know what, Richard, I've done really well there. And, and you still look back on that and say, that was, that was awesome. And then the other end of that scale where things haven't gone so well, uh, where you've banged your head against the door and think, oh, that was just awful, but I've learned something from it. Yeah, so I'll start with the one that ha hasn't gone so well. I think... Um, I think India in the early phases was pretty tough. Um, we acquired a business in, in that country. Um, we missed a, a critical small element but had a material impact on our lives, which is bottles going to the market and having to be returned through third parties. And we missed understanding that element quite well, and it cost us quite a lot of money in our first year of operation. And the lesson there was... 
Um, you know, pay attention to the right details, not always all the details. And so being quite a detail-oriented guy, you know, I tended to spend a lot of time on all of them rather than the right ones. And so that, that was a big lesson. Yeah, I think as far as great moments, I think still to come um, would be the answer. Um, but because I'm not that kind of guy to celebrate too much about what I've done well. If I was, if I was to single one out, I think, you know, there was a period where, uh, you know, we, we, we put a business together in, in Ecuador and backed it and we did some wonderful things and we were able to employ a lot more people, grow the business, make it really successful for shareholders and actually have fun doing it. And that, that sort of three-year period for me with, with a lot of, with, you know, one or two other South Africans only, but with other people from around the world was probably one of the more satisfying ones I've had in my life. And this one right now is is a wonderful moment, Dan, uh, to make a difference. And you know, I'm proud of of what our what we're doing. To be quite honest, we're gonna we're gonna merge out of this both as South Africa, but uh, as a company, but and also as as individuals, we will emerge out of this hopefully stronger, better. That is a perfect note on which to wrap up lunch. Some much needed and welcome optimism and confidence from one of our business leaders who faces his own challenges, as you've heard, uh, but is determined to come through them and to come through them stronger for it. Uh, Richard, thank you. It's always a delight spending time with you. You've become a good friend over the years, uh, but I've also learned quite a bit I didn't know about you today, <laughs> which is all great as well. Keep that smile in place. Uh, keep flying the South African flag all over the world and allow us to see brands like Amarula and Niederberg in markets everywhere. Uh, and good luck with the next stretch. I think it'll be challenging, but exciting. Thank you very much, Dan, and thanks for the wonderful opportunity to spend an hour with you eating and enjoying together. Uh, Richard Rushton, the CEO of Distel. He and I will both be off on a three-hour run to get rid of this lunch, but doing so certainly on my part, feeling inspired and uplifted by that conversation. This has been Business Unknown, made just for you by Bright Rock talking to different leaders each week. And this week, uh, a man with an incredible travel history, some wonderful business experience, and the feeling that despite everything we're going through, South Africa is going to be okay in the end. And I, I really do believe him when he says that. I'll be back again next week with another edition of Business Unknown. Thank you so much for joining us. Goodbye.